thank you so much, Beth. And thank you all for coming tonight. Is everyone as excited about this movie as I am? Yes. Awesome. So my background is in deep sea exploration, um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But when Beth invited me to come introduce the Life Aquatic, I just nearly jumped out of my skin because it holds a very special place in my heart. So before I get into the future of exploration, I want to back up a little bit and tell you about the very first research cruise that I led in 2007. Um, Bob Ballard was my graduate advisor. You might know him from discovering the Titanic and all sorts of other amazing things. Um, and he put me in charge of a month-long project to Greece and Ukraine and Turkey. And we were going to use this ship. It's the NATO Research Vessel Alliance. Look familiar? Also known as the Operation Hennessy Ship. Disney chartered it in 2004 to film the movie, turns out. And three years later, I was leading my very first cruise on board. I was so excited. <laughs> so we're going to be using this uh, remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, called Hercules, to investigate and partially excavate an ancient Byzantine shipwreck off the coast of Ukraine, um, which had been discovered the year before by our team. In fact, partially by Kelly's brother, who is with us here in the audience. <laughs> and in addition to Alliance, we also were going to be working with a team on board the Flamingo. Think Belafonte. <laughs> um, their lights went out. They ran out of water. <laughs> They had a disco ball on board. Um, and so they were going to be using this autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV. Um, so we had two boats. We had tons of equipment. We had an amazing team. We were going to be live streaming our cruise. It possibly was the first live stream 24-7 cruise on the internet ever. Um, so what could go wrong? <laughs> Turns out, a lot. <laughs> So early one morning, I believe August 17th, 2017, Flamingo called us to report that the AUV hadn't returned after a mission. Presumably it was flooded and sitting on the seafloor, but they didn't actually know where it was because it wasn't working anymore. Around midday, the president of Ukraine came out on his yacht for a visit. He wanted to drive Hercules and pick up an amphora. And <laughs> that was sitting on the shipwreck. Um, after a swim call, his entourage departed. My team spent the rest of the day trying to figure out how to find this autonomous vehicle um, and building this contraption that you see up there in the middle. This is called an elevator, um, so that if we did find it, we could recover it. We did find it. Awesome. Feeling pretty good about that. After dinner, the ship's alarm goes off. And the captain, no shits, this is all true. <laughs> so the captain usually, not usually, always would tell me in advance when we were going to do a fire drill so that I knew and everybody would be prepared, but he had not told me. So clearly this was a real thing. So everybody went down, grabbed their life jackets, came up to the muster station, we counted everybody, everyone was accounted for. It turns out there had been a fire in the engine room and we'd burned up the bow thruster. Awesome. Ship wasn't sinking, everything's okay, but we couldn't hold station anymore. Okay, go down to my cabin, grab some cookies. I, <laughs> I come back up on deck and the winch was screaming. I had never seen it going so fast. So I run up to the control van. What the hell's going on? Oh, Flamingo just called. They've been taking water on all day and they're sinking. <laughs> Emergency Hercules recovery. Fastest I've ever seen that happen. So we deployed our small boat to go over to Flamingo, get everybody off. We have like lounges full of people covered in blankets and life jackets. Um, all the while, the cameras are rolling <laughs> like throughout all of this. By dawn the next day, a tugboat had come out from Sevastopol and was towing Flamingo back to shore, hoping they were going to stay afloat. <laughs> all the way in. They did. It was fine. Um, and then later that afternoon, about 2.30 or so, we found um, the little penguin AUV and managed to recover it and steamed to Istanbul to get rid of the broken bow thruster. <laughs> so this was my introduction to leading expeditions, and it seriously felt like this. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
it appeared that I had, you know, managed the mayhem well enough. And by the time I finished my PhD a few years later, um, Bob had started an organization called the Ocean Exploration Trust and gotten his own ship and um, hired me to be the chief scientist of, of this amazing vessel. And over those years, um, I learned a whole lot, but never had an experience quite like, <laughs> quite like Alliance. So let's talk a little bit about how we explore the ocean and some of the things we might find. So first, when you go to a place that's never been explored before, you use typically a sonar that's mounted to the hull of the ship, can go thousands of meters through the water so you can make a map, because oftentimes maps just don't exist. Or the most recent map has been done with a lead, piece of lead on the bottom of a string that somebody dropped down 300 years ago. Um, so we make... <laughs> Seriously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you make a map, and then um, here's a little nice little video of Nautilus. And then you use uh, remotely operated vehicles. These are robotic vehicles that are tethered to the ship. You have a cable going down. Um, in our case, we had two vehicles that work together, Argus on top, Hercules on the bottom, and we're able to send video data um, back up to the ship where we're working. We've got a small team of people on board and then a satellite antenna on board, which is able to send live data, audio, video. Um, sorry about my language earlier. Um, <laughs> back to shore. Um, so that we can share it with people, um, anyone who wants to watch on nautiluslive.org, um, and also to include more scientists that we can, than we can fit on the ship, because it's a very limited space and, and space is precious. Um, so what kinds of things do we find with these tools? Uh, Nautilus spent several years in the Mediterranean and Black Sea area, and then over in the Caribbean, and then now it's, it's based in the Eastern Pacific. And when we were in the Mediterranean, a lot of uh, what we were doing was in archaeology. So we'd find ancient shipwrecks, particularly off the coast of Turkey. So this is an ancient Byzantine shipwreck, about 1,000, 1,500 years old. Um, and we were mapping out the ancient trade routes in the area. In other cases, we'd be looking for underwater volcanoes and would come across a World War II airplane, um, which is exactly what this is. We found that on Halloween 2011, Halloween night. It was kind of creepy, um, but amazing nonetheless. This was one of two planes shot down in the Battle of Pantelleria in the streets of Sicily. Um, also, looking for natural phenomena, this is a deep sea ecosystem off on a slope of an underwater volcano called Kikum Jenny in Grenada in the Caribbean Sea, um, which no one knew existed before. Brand new discovery. The biggest mussels in this area were 14 inches long. Huge, and they're living off methane and other organic rich um, fluids that are being squeezed up out of the seafloor. And in other cases, we just find adorable little things. <laughs> this is a stubby squid um, found off of California in the Channel Islands. And how can you not love the face? <laughs> so what we've been able to do is really incredible. And we made tons of discoveries all over the world. But there are still some things that, uh, that keep me up at night, um, some, some current challenges. So what are those? One is that we really can't cover that much area um, at any given time. These vehicles move very slowly, half a mile an hour if we're really cruising. Um, <laughs> really. Um, so this is a map of um, one of our expeditions to the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea, and those are the areas that we hit. And the little circles are much, much bigger than the area that we actually covered, right? And that's a whole year's field season. So we're, if you put end-to-end -end an ROV track line, maybe 800 miles long in a given year, being very, very generous. So that's like walking from Boston to North Carolina and calling all of the East Coast explored, right? We really haven't. There's still so much more out there. Access is another big challenge that, that plagues oceanography. Like many sciences, um, you know, the Operation Hennessy crew, very white and male, is that's 
pretty close representation of a lot of oceanographic team photos. Um, so we're really trying to um, diversify the field in, in as many ways as we can. And not only that, um, there are very few countries in the world that have the capabilities, the access to these kinds of tools. Um, you know, it's mostly Western, more affluent countries that can even do this. And a lot of developing countries have very deep areas of ocean and they just can't explore it because they don't have these kinds of tools. Um, not to mention the fact that it's very expensive. Um, <laughs> uh, these ships like Nautilus, like other federal research vessels, can cost 10 to 20 or more million dollars a year um, to cover that very small bit of area. Um, so we really will need to make um, things less expensive and access to data um, is very challenging. So oftentimes people have servers or hard drives full of data and it's really hard to collate it and, and really make discoveries from data that's already been collected. So if we're talking about 10 to 100,000 ship years to explore the entire ocean at tens to hundreds of millions of dollars a year, we're really not making that much progress. Um, so we really need to fundamentally change how we explore the ocean. Use those tools that we have, which are amazing, but also try and figure out how else can we do it. So that's why about a year and a half ago, I went to the Media Lab at MIT so that we can really look at um, how to design and deploy new tools to better understand and share the ocean with people. So we have a lot of fantastic projects um, going on. I'll highlight just a few of those because I'd like to get onto the movie. Um, My Deep Sea, My Backyard is a project working with um, all the little pictures at the bottom, all the people who are working at the project working on the project, um, working in uh, Kiribati and Trinidad. So these are developing island nations that don't have deep sea capabilities. So it's working with people, students, educators, scientists in these countries. Um, to enable them to have these kinds of deep sea technologies so that they can explore their own waters and be able to use them and understand what kind of resources they have. Um, also working with the learning initiative at the Media Lab and, and lots of other partners to uh, create Lego underwater robots. How fun is that? So we can work with kids and they can build their own underwater robots and because Legos obviously everyone knows and are fun to play with and how can they um, explore their own waterways and connect with the environment. Uh, we're also using um, advancements in other fields like computer science, machine learning, computer vision to be able to automatically track and classify things that we see underwater because analysis of huge amounts of video is extremely labor intensive um, and nearly impossible in some cases. So how can we um, really push the technology forward to be able to make discoveries from data we have but then also ones that we collect um, and also creating different kinds of experiences. So Emily Salvador is a master's student at the Media Lab and she created this interactive coral reef display that is at the MIT Museum right now. If anyone's interested, head on over to Cambridge um, and you can see her work there. So we have all these different kinds of projects from collecting data to figuring out how to analyze it and then how do you share it on, on a big scale. And we've really only been around for about a year, so we're really um, hoping to grow in coming years. And it's really looking at this spectrum of exploration from the big ships and the big vehicles down to how can students go out and explore their own waterways and really understand and become closer to nature so that you can have all of those different feeds of data and information to discover the ocean and then be able to share it with learning, with science, with media, with policy, um, all of these things that are so important to us. Because um, if you don't know what we have, then we can't really use it responsibly. And finally, I want to wrap up with why do we even do this in the first place? Um, why do we explore the ocean? Why do we care? Um, is it just to find cute little stubby-eyed squids? Um, no, we're rely completely reliant on the ocean for our survival on this planet. So from the air we breathe to the rare earth minerals that drive our laptops, to fish we eat, to navigation, to biopharmaceuticals, which are only becoming a bigger thing to play in recreation, because we all love water in the sea. At least I do. I assume you all do, because you're here. Um, <laughs> so really, how do we use the ocean without using it up and putting these things in peril? So I will leave it at that and invite you to enjoy the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>